My name is Simran Sethi. I'm a journalist who uh, focuses on the environment and is currently writing a book on the loss of that at my university. And I'm very honored to have been invited by C4 to moderate this high-level panel discussion on the role of forest landscapes for food and diversity. We are incredibly fortunate to have a diverse group representing various stakeholders on the panel. This includes Andreas Beckerman, Counselor and Head of Development Cooperation for the Embassy of Germany for Indonesia, David Cardin, Partner in Charge of Asia at Jones Day and former U.S. Ambassador to ASEAN, David Cooper, Director for the Scientific Assessments and Monitoring Branch for the Convention on Biological Diversity, Christina Egenter, Deputy Director for Social Development at the World Wildlife Fund, and Leslie Potter, Visiting Fellow in the Resource Management Department, uh, Resource Management in Asia Pacific Program at the Crawford School of Public Policy at Australia National University. I'm going to take a few minutes now to address the question of food security that undergirds this discussion, and then open it up to what I will assure you will be a very dynamic and honest session. And then I have a few questions, but we'll be encouraging dialogue amongst the panelists, and we'll then open up to questions from the audience after that time. The urgent need to feed our growing population is a question that some businesses, policymakers, scientists, NGOs, even nations would have you believe has a silver bullet answer. Make more food by any means necessary. Unfortunately, the often cited refrain of doubling global food production by 2050, taken from the 2006 FAO report, World Agriculture Towards 2030-2050, has been taken out of context. This report assumed a shift in commodity crops away from staple foods, excluded fruits and vegetables, and did not account for food waste or the lack of purchasing power parity. Despite this, it has become part of the dominant narrative on food and agriculture and has informed policy recommendations and land use changes. This has resulted in the clearing of forests in the name of agriculture or in the name of planting non-edible crops that may allegedly increase purchasing power, the reduction of diversified land use in favor of mine cropping, an increased use of hybrid and transgenic seeds, and an increase in cheap processed foods, all in the name of feeding people. But feeding people, as we will further explore today, requires more than inexpensive caloric intake. Food security is defined with reference to the 1996 World Food Summit definition as existing when all people, at all times, have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. So let's unpack that dominant refrain about our hungry planet. Between 1968 and 2008, the percentage of the world living in hunger actually shrank from 26 to 13 percent. So now, for the first time in human history, overweight people outnumber underweight ones. But both groups suffer from micronutrient malnutrition, including vitamin A, iron, or iodine deficiency. As a global population, we are what author Raj Patel calls both stuffed and starved. But we are not hungry because of a lack of food. For the past 20 years, the rate of global food production has increased faster than the rate of global population growth. The world already produces more than one and a half times enough food to feed everyone on the planet, which is enough to feed the population of 9 billion that we anticipate by 2050. Global agriculture produces 17% more calories per person than it did 30 years ago, despite a 70% population increase. Increase. But the question is, are these calories nutritious? Are these diets diversified? Are genetically engineered foods like golden rice our only and best solution? The abundance of food is not equally distributed. An increased production will not achieve the goal of food security without improved distribution and a reduction in the 1.3 billion tons of food wasted in both the industrialized north and global south. More than 60% of underfed people live in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, what is known as hunger's center of gravity. The irony is that fully half of these food insecure people are small farmers living on less than two US dollars a day. Because even though they grow food, they lack the means to meet all their nutritional needs, they lack the means to meet all their nutritional needs through producing or buying food. This undernourishment is caused by poverty and inequality not scarcity. 
And this is why forest biodiversity is so critical. Research by C4 on dietary quality and tree cover in Africa discovered in their study of 21 demographic, 211 demographic, demographic health surveys of 93,000 children across Africa, a positive correlation between nutrition and forests. Children who live in areas with more tree cover have more diverse and nutritious diets. And this holds independent of income level. So today, we will address the importance of biodiversity and forest-based ecosystem services and their role in food security and improved nutrition, including the ways in which forest biodiversity can help mitigate the effects of the nutritional transition from traditional diets to industrialized diets. We'll also look at the factors shaping and eroding agrobiodiversity, addressing not only genetic erosion, but corresponding cultural transformations, and exploring how local communities value forests, and what impacts their valuations might have on future forest management, and the 1.6 billion people who are forest dependent. An integrated landscape approach will need to not only advance research, support sustainable investments, and offer a continued dialogue on the importance of forests, but ensure the drivers of deforestation are engaged and those actors are motivated to change. And that those independent on forest landscapes for food and biodiversity have not only food security, but food sovereignty. Now this is no small task, and I am really glad we have experts who can shed light on how best to achieve this. I'd like to start by inviting each panelist to share for five minutes opening remarks on these topics, starting with Leslie Potter, visiting fellow at Australia National University. Uh, let me say first of all that I'm glad that we're having this session in the Kalimantan. Most of my research in Indonesia has in fact been in Kalimantan. This is an area which always had very large amounts of forest. It is also an area where the forest has recently shrunk very considerably. It is now an area where oil palm is growing very rapidly. I want to focus particularly in dealing with these topics on a part of West Kalimantan. I'm going to just give you a sort of a case study of uh, the district of Sangao, which is where I've done quite a lot of work. Uh, and where these issues are very pertinent. Back in 1884, when we got the first Dutch reports about what was going on with Gaia agriculture, the big emphasis was on the biodiversity of the available resources. People were planting not just rice, but all sorts of other things, uh, like tubers and so on, uh, pumpkins and cassava and these sorts of things. They had huge amounts of fruit, surrounding their longhouses. These were called Boam. Um, a great variety of resources of all kinds. When you come down to the 1970s, when oil palm was first introduced into Kalimantan, it was introduced into Sangal. And there, people were saying, oh, this shifting cultivation system, these Swedens, there's too many people already, they can't feed themselves. When they started to look into it, they discovered that, in fact, they were quite food secure. There was enough rice. There was enough vegetables that they could collect from their planted forests. The forests in these areas were a human artifact. They were things that people had planted themselves, of useful trees. And they had a big tradition of planting things which were going to be useful. Not just food, but all sorts of other trees. Uh, and uh, food, trees that they could be used for building houses, for example. Um, there were also some natural forests. These were shrinking, but they were being carefully maintained. People had a communal interest uh, and were able to take the products from these forests. So that although they had their swiddens and although they had their rice production, both upland and also lowland rice, they were able to still contain biodiversity. Now, Oil palm began in this area and it increased very markedly so that by 2008 uh, Sangao had the largest amount of oil palm and of rubber in the whole of Kalimantan. Uh, and in 2009, of course, the prices of everything collapsed. 
so that oil palm was no longer, they were no longer able to get much money from that. And it, the government which had been suggesting monoculture began to say, you better diversify, you better have some people starting to grow other things, to grow food crops. But there was no longer much land left for that. Since 2009, oil palm has increased very markedly across Kalimantan and in Sangal. Now, the prices of oil palm, uh, palm oil have been decreasing over the last year. There are some problems with people no longer having land. They've sold their land. Everything has become much more inequitable. You get a very diverse landscape. Some villages have refused to take any oil palm. Others are completely into oil palm. But they can no longer very often get sufficient income, especially if they're just working as plantation workers. Back in 2009, there was a government survey on districts which were suffering from food insecurity. Surprisingly, maybe Sangar was the most rubber and the most oil palm was also one of the most food insecure. And that, the reason for that was that the people who were working not as oil palm smallholders necessarily who owned land, but those who no longer had land or were working as landless laborers. But this situation continues and there are now more people in that situation. So what I would just like to say is that there is a, a strong need for encouraging more diversity, uh, encouraging even among the companies the provision for allowing people to spend some of their land growing their own food, and also encouraging independent smallholders to do the same thing. It may not be bringing them in necessarily as much money as oil palm when the oil palm prices are high. But when the oil palm prices get low, and those in rubber as well, then you have to be very worried about food insecurity in this situation. Thank you. Point. It could be, uh, doesn't have to be 
either one solution, but it's one aspect that we need to look at. So when we come back to food security, food security uh, is not enough to just talk about security. We need to talk about resilience, we need to talk about the uh, food system. That's why FAO last year called the uh, World Food Day on October uh, 2013 was about food system, resilient food system, and uh, not resilient. But the system issue, the connection, the linkages that need to be seen and identified and, uh, and given resilience. And the other big issue is food uh, sovereignty. Uh, and food sovereignty skipped the political aspect of it, which, to, for which some have uh, strong uh, sentiments or whatever, for political reasons, not for um, interest or, or for substance issues. But then we are talking about things that the document in Rio Plus 20, the future we want, address to some extent. It doesn't say we need food, we need uh, nutrition and uh, safe food. Another aspect of it, which food sovereignty talks about, is we also need a culturally appropriate food. And that's a very interesting aspect. So, and then the linkages, again, the connection between uh, food that brings together suppliers, producers with consumers. And this is uh, a lot of movements now look at this connection or to rebuild this uh, connection, bringing closer together the consumers with the producers. And this is all uh, very important because food is, after all, a lot of anthropologists have been telling us stories about this, is identity, is our culture, and it is our people's identity. Uh, and some of it is already gone. Coming all this together at the practical level, landscape level, I just want to look at uh, what the traditional productive landscapes is about. And it addresses a lot of these issues. And I'm just referring, like uh, uh, Leslie Potter earlier, about Kalimantan case. This is the highlands of uh, Krayan in the heart of Borneo, in uh, what is now North Kalimantan. Uh, and what do we see? We see a lot of genetic diversity, a uh, lot of uh, cultivars, with uh, food production that is now is mostly rice, but it's a lot of varieties of rice, uh, planted regularly more than 10, 15 for each village. Uh, food uh, fruit, uh, diversity, we're talking about uh, local crisis, yes, but with local solutions, so they don't go beyond the boundaries of what is addressable. Um, and all of this is, is important. The last point that I would like to raise is, uh, are there solutions, is that maintaining a traditional productive landscape the solution to food security in the future? Uh, yes and no in the sense that we need also to, to look for innovative solutions, bringing in private partnerships, linking them up with communities, uh, finding uh, premium value for a lot of these products, and looking at these products as products of a particular landscape, landscape of a particular cultural history, not just a biological biodiversity product to, uh, to be sold on the market. So I close here for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to make three points really. Um, the first, um, that biodiversity is essential for food production uh, and also for good nutrition. Um, food is biodiversity. If we look even at our staple crops, uh, such as rice. Um, studies by FAO have shown us that the nutrient content beyond the calories um, can vary um, by orders of magnitude between one variety and the next. So maintaining these uh, local varieties can be uh, really important. Um, but then there's a whole range of, um, of species that we have to draw upon and, and many of these um, do come from the forest. So you mentioned in your introductory remarks the the C4 study that showed uh, in Africa a very strong uh, correlation between health of children and um, tree cover, basically. Um, and you know, if we look at some of these, some of these fruits and trees, 
they're highly nutritious. So we need to, to make sure that we're not just looking at food production in terms of calories, which the production um, um, research and so on has tended to focus on perhaps too much, um, but to look at the, the quality. Um, some baobab fruits, for example, in Burkina Faso, you know, just 100 grams of those will provide 100% uh, close to 100% of a whole range of, of micronutrients. Um, if you look on the other side, um, bushmeat uh, in Madagascar, for instance, if, if the local people there did not have access to the bushmeat that they have and there were not um, replacements found, uh, the, the, the study showing that you get an increase in child anemia by about 30 percent. So these are in, important. Uh, biodiversity in, in these respects are important for for, for health. Um, and then, of course, we need the biodiversity to support the ecosystem services that enable the production of food, both in agricultural ecosystems and in the wider landscape. Um, uh, this water that. Um, uh, aqua Danone produce. Um, they, they, they are interested in, in protecting the forest because they know that the, the water supply is dependent on that. In Southeast Asia, I think the, the economic value of crops um, per year dependent on insect pollination is something around $16 billion per year. Um, there's been a, a lot of experience here in Indonesia looking at rice production, of making use of the natural enemies of rice pests through, in, uh, through integrated pest management uh, and through active farmer involvement in that, through the FAO uh, Farmer Field Sports Program. So these are just different ways in which biodiversity support ecosystem services. The second point though is that we will only succeed in conserving biodiversity, in conserving the forests, if we um, also take care of um, people's livelihood needs and their socio-economic aspirations. Um, and this means that we do have to recognize it's going to be competing demands for land use. Um, the oil palm, as we've heard, um, um, can lead to, to, uh, to nutritional problems uh, developing. At the same time, we know that a lot of economic development in this, in this country and other parts of Southeast Asia uh, depend on oil palm development. Uh, last week we had a workshop in, in Jambi province for the ASEAN countries and travelled to one remaining fragment of forest. And to get there we went through a, a sea of oil palm, but we could also see the economic development in, the, in those villages. Can we do better than that? Can we also perhaps introduce home gardens? Can we address? Uh, biodiversity in the oil palm plantations, and can we have um, land use planning, spatial planning, that allows those forest fragments to remain also. So we need to look at these things in, in a landscape uh, perspective. Um, the uh, ecosystem approach principles developed under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the landscape approach principles um, developed by C4 um, I think give us some good guidance in how we can manage these multiple uh, demands and involve uh, and negotiate among the multiple uh, stakeholders. Finally, um, we have, the international community has um, goals for poverty reduction, for food security, for climate and for biodiversity. Uh, on the latter, for instance, the Aichi biodiversity target um, agreed by all countries in, uh, in, in the Goya and then in the, in the United Nations, look for halving deforestation rates at least by 2020, increasing um, restoration of degraded lands, uh, at least 15% of degraded lands under restoration by, by 2020. The goal is also on maintaining genetic diversity and the like. The question is how do we achieve all these goals simultaneously? How do we achieve the goals for poverty reduction, food, uh, food security, uh, biodiversity, uh, conservation and, and climate change. Um, the models that are done show that this is possible, that as many have said, there's no single uh, silver bullet solution to this. Um, we do have to recognise, as Christine said, that we're dealing with complex systems and so we'll need 
complex answers in, uh, with, with many elements to those. Um, as the President said in his opening remarks yesterday morning, a key part of this will be equity. We will not be able to uh, reconcile all of these demands without uh, equity as being a key part of sustainable development. Uh, we heard this morning about the call for uh, a forest development goal. And I think we certainly would like to see biodiversity and forests um, well integrated into the sustainable development uh, framework. Um, perhaps as a goal in their own right, but perhaps even more importantly, uh, and following on from the theme of this panel, to see biodiversity and ecosystems, biodiversity and forests reflected in the goals uh, dealing with food production, uh, water provision, and the like. Thank you. Pass the microphone on to the Is it my turn? It's your turn. Oh, you got a mic in your hand. I'm going to come down here. I, uh, I will have traveled 45 hours and almost 20,000 miles to get here to spend an hour with you, so I want to come down with you. Um, I'm not an expert in anything. I got pretty good after three years of being U.S. Ambassador to ASEAN at one thing, however, which is convening conversations. And so I'm assuming that all of you are experts in something, but I'd like to ask just a baseline question. Are there any economists in the room? Are there any experts in infectious diseases? Anybody build infrastructure? Is there a tax lawyer here? <laughs> I want to promise you that all of those people and much more have a lot to say about whether we solve the problems that we're faced with. The question is, why aren't they in the room? And that's an interesting question. And I can tell you that one of the things I did as U.S. Ambassador ASEAN is I always insisted that there were young people in the room. I never spoke without young people in the room, so thank you for being here. And I've also proposed recently that every corporation in the world have a youth board. And the reason for that is young people change conversations. So I, is there anybody in the room that doesn't think we should take a landscape approach to nutritional security? Show me your hands. I didn't think so. So we're sitting here and we're talking about a landscape approach and we all already agree that we should be taking that approach. I think the one thing I could contribute after having come so far, and, I, and I'm not sure if I have anything to contribute, but I don't want to come so far and fail. The one thing I can maybe help with is how do we do the landscapes of the conversations we need to have? How do we decide who needs to be in the room? I'm, as I said, not an expert in anything, but I can promise you the most important person who's not here is a tax lawyer. I like to think about that for just a little bit. I, uh, I ask myself the question a lot of times, why aren't we winning? Why are we losing so badly? And I have no real wisdom on that, but I will offer the following. We are all prisoners of our own lenses. I'm a lawyer. That's not why I'm a tax lawyer, by the way. I'm not a tax lawyer. But we see the world through our experience and our education. And that causes us to see quite narrowly. We also have trouble seeing the big things, the many forces, the cause and effects, how things are connected to each other. We know they are. We know that if we deforest over Jakarta, Jakarta's going to flood us. We know that. And we know other things are connected. We know that if there are no fish in the South China Sea, something I worked hard on, that communities along the oceans in Southeast Asia will fail, and they will have even greater nutritional insecurity as a consequence. And there will probably be more fundamentalism that come as a consequence as part of an answer to their problems. We know these things, yet we don't do anything about it. And there's another reason to fail, and that's to have those that have power and prestige and prerogative are the adaptive adversaries that are trying to build the world to suit their interests. And let's just call it out, because that's what's happening. And we need, actually, to build the alliances to win the future for the young people in the room, because I'm 62 years old. I'm not, I'm not coming this far because this is my world. I'm not getting paid to come here. There are no appearance fees. And um, I came here on my own. So how do we do that? Well, 
I can only tell you we've had a little bit of success doing it recently. But I offer the following thought to you. I'm going to give you a specific example, as you think I'm talking at 50,000 feet, because while I'm not an expert in anything, I have studied every one of these topics in the region deeply. So the average size of a farm in Java is 0.4 hectares. And um, if you band 10 of those farms together, that gives you 4 hectares. If 10 families farm 10, 4 hectares, by my calculations, I will spare you the math. One growing cycle will feed all those families in rice. The other growing cycle, they could raise beef, high value products, and the like. They'd have a cash crop. It would help with poverty. It's a pretty simple solution. Why isn't it happening? Why isn't anybody in the Department of Agriculture here proposing this idea? Why is there no infrastructure in the rural parts of Java? You know, why is there no electricity? And there's no revenue. Well, that's the tax lawyer. So we need to think about these things as being connected. I'm going to run out of time, but I'm going to offer one story. Before, I, when I, I left the post of the U.S. Ambassador to ASEAN in December of last year, and I went home to Christ for Christmas, and had been home for a long while, and I was asked by the chairman of the board, of a Fortune 50 company to come see him to talk about what he called food security, which I call nutritional security. He wanted to know what I thought was happening in Southeast Asia. And I talked to him for over a couple hours on a Saturday, snowy Saturday morning. And I offered him some of these views. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Mr. Ambassador, I absolutely accept what you're saying as to how we need to approach this but it's hard to be optimistic. And then he looked at me after a moment of hesitation, dead in the eye, and he said, but you know, we're all haunted by the truth. And I told him, you know where the word haunt comes from? And he didn't. The root of the word haunt is home. Haunted home is redundant. And what I said to him was, that I have found in my brief experience in Southeast Asia that the people that see what needs to happen are allies for change and that we need to empower them. My favorite poet is a man named Wendell Berry and Wendell Berry said the following, we have lived our lives, we've lived our lives based on the assumption that what was good for us was good for the world. We have been wrong. We must learn to live our life by a contrary assumption that what is good for the world is good for us. And we must learn what is good for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Beckerman. Thank you very much. When you ask whether there's an economist in the room. No, we got one. <laughs> I have the role to represent a development partner and I will give some ideas on two levels. First on the uh, global level, how we answer the question of forest landscapes for food and biodiversity. So we are a signatory with Germany of the Convention of Biological Diversity and our uh, Chancellor in 2008 made the commitment that from 2013 on we uh, commit 500 um, million uh, euro per year for this uh, biodiversity projects. And economists like me and my colleagues have to put this into practice. And um, we have um, a wealth of uh, lessons learned on our uh, agricultural and on our forestry uh, projects. And of course, we bring this together. And already on the global level, without citing the specific examples from uh, Kalimantan, where we extensively traveled in the last uh, four years, we uh, find that um, the, uh, area, the management of protected areas and uh, sustainable management of natural resources can only be done um, if we improve the living conditions of the local people. And this topic um, we'll come back a second time and I go to the project level. So, 
uh, we are active in the three big tropical forest uh, regions of the world, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and here in Southeast Asia, and among other regions also in Southern and Eastern Africa, the Andes and uh, Himalaya. All this to put the connection which has been shown between biodiversity and food security into practice. And uh, how do we answer these challenges on the project level? So, our government has commissioned international research institutions and international NGOs to test the landscape approach in a number of pilot countries, including Indonesia. And then we have um, portfolio of um, long-running forest projects and we introduce these ideas into the project side. What um, we have learned is that we have to address the issues on the policy level, on the regional level and on the local level. So our, our programs, and now I come to Indonesia, they all always put in, um, in the concrete villages where we have the pilots most of them in Kalimantan, but also in Sumatra, and in the future in uh, North Sudanese. And uh, when I traveled, I noticed that these projects, um, which are red projects, um, use the approach to uh, enable people to give them the rights, because they, get, they improve their food security um, when they know that the area they work on um, is theirs in the sense that they have property rights uh, to these areas. And we prove this by organizing, uh, by settling the disputes between the villages and by organizing the participatory mapping. And we see already an improvement when um, they identify with these borders, so to say, of their uh, villages. And we, um, as, as to prepare our we um, invest in their livelihoods, for example, through non-timber forest products, improvement of traditional fruit gardens, poultry, and other food production. So, um, we invest here about 18 million US dollar equivalent in forest project every year, and, um, but we still work only in pilot areas. So the state, our partner, has to do most of the work. And we are also uh, there to assist uh, them on national level. We bring innovations um, together with others, and they're not the only one, by financing two ecosystem restoration concessions um, in Bukitigapuni um, and Tarapan, and innovations in finance, which is uh, very important, and um, establishing sustainable financing mechanisms. This applies here, but also in Vietnam, where forest rehabilitation is combined with financial incentives for communities to maintain forest investments. These are some of the things that we do as an answer to the challenge of uh, forest landscape for food and biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to uh, jump right into a few questions, and just so we're clear, we actually have about 15 minutes to talk uh, here on the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions for 25 minutes, and then five minutes of concluding comments. Um, I'd like to build on what Mr. Carden was really expressing, and that is we are facing such staggering losses in terms of uh, deforestation and the loss of agricultural biodiversity, and I would like each person on the panel to address this question of which actors need to be engaged? What are the biggest obstacles that we're facing? And you don't have to address all of these points, but some of them, please. And how, how does forest governance and, and land use policies and market opportunities shape what we're seeing right now and shape what we can create for the future? I'll start here. Mr. Uh, Dr. Cooper, please. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so we are losing um, biodiversity, we're losing, we're losing forests, um, but this isn't happening in the same way all over the world. In many parts of the world we've seen forests come back um, quite a while ago in, in, uh, in the eastern part of the United 
United States, for instance. Um, and if we look to, um, to South America, um, we see 20 years ago, the big headlines on, on deforestation was not about Indonesia, it was about the Amazon. The Amazon is burning, it's hopeless. Everyone said it's impossible to do anything about it. And yet, in over a 10 year period, the rate of deforestation in the Amazon fell by 80%. Um, why? Well, a whole list of things. There is no silver bullet. Um, certainly, uh, law, legislation plays a part in that. Um, well, there is a law in Brazil, the Forest Code, that says that 80% of the land in the Amazon must be under native vegetation. That's 80% in any land holding. Of course, that's outside protected areas. Um, so another thing that was done during that period was a massive increase in protected areas and in indigenous lands, lands given to the indigenous communities to manage, which, by the way, were the most effective of the protected areas. There's also investment in enforcement, but that could only work because they also had very good wall-to-wall -wall monitoring. So the one map that we've heard a lot about here is, is critical. We need um, good monitoring, we need data, it has to be owned by the country, um, and it needs to be near, near real time as well as accurate. And that is in place in Brazil. All that information is in the public domain, that's another important aspect. That information must be in the public domain so that everyone can see it, everyone can question it. As, um, as Crystal said this morning, then everyone can improve it. So you need this whole mixture of things. You also need economic incentives. Um, you can have a law, but you'll only get compliance with that law if it's economically, socioeconomically possible to do that. Um, and so, uh, there are credits for farmers in Brazil. Municipalities with high rates of deforestation are denied access to those credits. So there's a whole mixture of um, positive and negative assess, uh, assess, you know, incentives. Just, just one thing is that the forest code um, applies to the whole country. It applies, it's actually, it's called the forest code, it's actually about native vegetation. It covers agricultural lands as well as forest lands. So as well as a one map, I think what we need is a one law um, that covers um, spatial planning, um, covers basic requirements for maintenance of native vegetation, for example, uh, to protect against erosion, uh, and minimum levels of native vegetation required, not just in forest lands, but in all lands. Thank you. For well, well, the actors, our partners um, are the, uh, the governments and in the example of uh, Indonesia we are helping the Ministry of Forestry to do their innovations with international expertise which we can bring in. And I've mentioned on the uh, local level that the partners are actually the uh, communities uh, and empowering them is very important. But um, of course the, the the scene of the actors is much broader, which we have learned in this room yesterday with the first dialogues, but I mentioned just those two groups. Yeah, there are of course um, some recent interesting initiatives uh, among the companies that work in Indonesia as well as other places, like Ga and Roma, um, saying no deforestation, no clearance of peat, and so forth. And these things are, are very useful. Um, together with uh, government attempts now to look much further towards uh, sustainable uh, forestry. Um, in terms of the oil palm situation and in terms of landscape, I would like to just reintroduce the idea of designer landscapes, which was brought up a few years ago by people who were working in C4. Um, and they suggested that, in fact, if the plantations could concentrate on improving their yields to a very considerable extent, and that is possible genetically, then it might be possible, it would be possible for smallholders to engage in a more organic agroforestry sort of system, whereby they had mixed cultivation with quite a lot of food crops, <coughs> as well as the oil palm and other crops they might want to grow, such as rubber, 
Um, and that would give them a much more diverse economy. Um, while at the same time the plantations would produce sufficient oil palm to enable the, uh, the actual needs of the country to be fulfilled. If these smallholders wished to produce more oil palm, they were able to do that because by that stage the genetics would be sorted out to the point that the high, high production would be possible. I think the problem with Indonesia today is that there's been a lot of expansion of oil palm, um, mainly looking at uh, extending the situation into more and more lands, rather than concentration so much on improving yields. It's coming, but there needs to be much more of that. And if you can do that, then you need not perhaps pressure the smallholders to quite the same extent. And it would be possible, particularly for independent smallholders, who now have the choice as to what they grow, um, to be able to produce a much more, variety, a much more varied uh, kind of agriculture. It's possible to do these things. In Brazil, for example, and you're mentioning Brazil, um, there are some projects there in the state of Pará uh, where it's, it's been shown that oil palm can be grown in an agroforestry system, uh, whereby if you look at the combinations of um, ground covers and other crops that you plant with the oil palm, you can get, in fact, more productivity with fewer oil palm trees. Uh, and this has been shown to be quite workable, so that there are certainly other ways of doing things. And I would suggest it's a good idea to look at the landscape and think we don't have to have always just the same landscape as huge plantations, small areas with small borders, um, and perhaps the forest dwindling um, because we want to just expand more and more. It's possible to do things differently, and I think people should be starting to look into that. In 1776, there were 600 million acres of forests in the United States. Today, there are 700 million acres of forests in the United States. How did that happen? It happened because of George Marsh, who wrote a book in 1967 called The Man in Nature, who was the longest serving American diplomat in American diplomatic history, something I'm kind of proud about. I only lasted three years. George Marsh understood the relationship between human health and forests, and he thought it was terrible what happened in the United States. But in 1880, the life expectancy in the United States was 40 years old. It was 40 years old in 1776. It was 40, year old, 40, year, 40 years old in 1880. What happened? What happened were economics, and, and the movement of people from rural economies to manufacturing and service economies and the creation of wealth that took pressure off of the agricultural sector, didn't have to expand. And it was also true, of course, there was an aggregation of land. I mentioned before the example of 10 families banding together in Java to grow rice and one cycle would feed them, the other cycle they would have cash crops. Why doesn't that happen? Land use. There's no land use laws in the life that sort of make that possible. And so the question is, uh, the, the, that how do we move from an agrarian economy to a manufacturing and service economy, which takes the pressure off of the agricultural sector? 40% of Thailand's economy, pardon me, 8% of Thailand's economy is agrarian. 15% of Indonesia's economy is agrarian. In both countries, 40% of the people work in the agrarian or the agricultural sector. 40%. How do you move 40% of Indonesians or some significant percentage of Indonesians into the manufacturing sector? How do you move ties into the manufacturing and the service sector so they can create wealth, so the income gap doesn't open up? How do you do that? Education, that's a start. What's happened here? They've withdrawn English language instruction in the rural areas of Indonesia. When I read that, that was like a canary in the cave. Why are they withdrawing English language instruction in Indonesia? in the rural areas, the people that need it the most in order to try to move out of the places they're in because they're worried about food security. All foods can mean food shocks because 2008 was a scalding event. And now the policy has to be we need to make certain we don't have a shortage of food. I understand that. That's very destabilizing. You see, what's happen you see what happens when that happens. There's other ways to do it other than keeping people on 4.4 hectare farms to raise enough rice to feed themselves and a little bit more. Give them the land so that they can aggregate. 
given the opportunity with infrastructure and with electrification and education to move to other sectors of the economy, create spaces for them in Jakarta where they can actually do that kind of work. I'm not just talking about Indonesia because this could be applied to any other country in the region. I, has, I want to make certain that's clear. I'm just talking about Indonesia because we're here right now. I can do this in any do this in any ASEAN country, including Singapore. So I, those are my views as to where we are. Uh, thank you. I would, uh, coming back to um, small examples, but good examples. So I would say that focusing on traditional productive landscapes, and there are many, a multiplicity of it in Indonesia and in Asia and elsewhere, it's a good start to learn from and then innovate from there, coming back to your questions. And what I'm saying is because productive uh, traditional productive landscapes have a lot of experience with multi-uses, multi-actors. So it's not just one forest, never. Um, they have a lot of traditional knowledge that is very associated with the, the ecological basis of, of that particular landscape. So they know where to cut and where not to cut, what to use and where not to use. Uh, there is a lot of regulations built around that knowledge to protect and maintain resilient landscapes. And then there is a lot of integration between forests and fields, something that we have uh, heard before also. Agroforestry, agroecology, uh, blending the landscapes into multi-uses. That's all very important. But then we need to step this up a little bit. Innovation is important. Bringing in private sector is important, as long as this is built around community and private uh, partnerships where communities still have a say and control at local level of what kind of innovation they want and they can use because there is no point in input from external input remaining external input there is a lot of uh, need for investment investment upstream otherwise you, you force economies and local economies to be extractive all the time because they need to bring their produce somewhere else where it's going to be processed, where it's going to be sold, where it's going to have a higher market value. So this needs to be reversed. Um, and innovation, yes, but built on tradition because there is a lot of the tradition that can be upheld, maintained and highlighted, amplified uh, to be of more use. Um, so I would, uh, and I would conclude with saying, markets yes, but people focused markets are important uh, to, for food security and productive landscapes. Thank you. Uh, this is so, so right for so many different directions, but I'll, I'll end with one final question and open up to the audience, and that is. Um, what's really coming up for me is also the question of sort of what is what is the story? What are the messages that we're getting out? Christina, you just mentioned this indigenous knowledge that is often not discussed that should be discussed. You know, David, you were talking earlier about kind of the transformation of the Amazonian rainforest. In part, that was due to consumer awareness that had not perhaps been there before. And I'm wondering as we move forward, you know, Naveen Sharma from the World Agroforestry Center said agroforestry has the complete nutritional pyramid. This is the high-level panel on food and nutrition and biodiversity. And I wonder if you could just uh, talk a bit about um, not only the role of biodiversity, but this value that's often overlooked is um, community perception of the forest and the value that we, of course, count in ecosystem services and accounting. But I'm also curious to know um, how we transform the conversation around status and identity and meaning, because this also plays into it. This evolution is, is one um, oriented toward economic prosperity, but it's also one oriented toward a different kind of identity as we see an evolution in what we grow and what we eat. So if you could please address in your experience, and anyone on the panel who feels comfortable talking about this, um, what we can do to transform this conversation from uh, consumers, from producers, from, um, from the people involved in, throughout the chain, you know, governance structures as well as, or I should say government officials and policymakers who are in the room, as well as those who, who simply want to have more agency and participate in this conversation. I think there's a problem um, in terms of 
nutrition and agroforestry and so forth. I think everybody recognises that uh, there is huge biodiversity uh, in the forests and in the agricultural systems in Indonesia if you start to look into it. Christina mentioned the areas in Kaimantan. Um, there are some amazing examples of biodiversity not only in rice varieties but in varieties of everything else. In Kalimantan, huge varieties of durian, for example, of mango, these things are hardly recognised. There are lots of fruits and vegetables there that don't make it to the market. These things are fantastic and they ought to be more encouraged. But I think there's a big problem with Indomiization. Everybody is just eating Indomie, which has basically very little food value. And I think this is one of the huge problems in terms of diet. You find people in a diet long house, and what do they eat? Indomie. And they're surrounded by all this amazing biodiversity. And yet somehow it's easy to buy this packet of noodles from the local shop. It has a little bit of flavour. It has very little else. And I think this whole question of identity and, um, you know, what sort of food is good food, this is, there's a need for maybe more education at school level and other levels to say, what kind of foods do you really need to eat? What do you need to feed your young children? These sorts of things need to be known more. You don't feed them in their meat. <laughs> so following on, following on from that, um, I think one key aspect here is doing what we can to promote and protect uh, food cultures, the cultures that each country, community has around their food. Um, if we look at South Korea, for instance, it's transformed from a poor country after the, um, the Korean War into now uh, one of the rich countries, and yet it's maintained its food culture. Um, that's what they eat, but also how they eat. Uh, it affects, therefore, not just nutrition, but food waste. Um, you referred at the beginning to the problem of uh, malnutrition and obesity among those that have plenty or access to plenty. And again, food cultures are important in, in preventing that. Um, so I think you know you can look at the examples and, and try and learn from the examples of like Korea or like the Mediterranean, which is also uh, to a large extent compared to North America or, or Northern Europe, um, maintaining the food culture. Uh, certainly, public policy can help there. Um, school meals, um, public procurement. Uh, around those um, protection of uh, traditional indigenous uh, diets um, and also perhaps recognizing the value of the family farm so this um, 2014 uh, is the international year of the family farm um, most of the income most of the export earning of countries agricultural countries comes from big farms um, but most of the food and nutrition that people eat actually still comes from family farms. Um, again, in Brazil there was a survey, uh, in Brazil they have two ministries right, for agriculture, essentially. They have a ministry of agriculture which deals with agribusiness, uh, and that generates a lot of money for the country that is important in supporting some of the social programs, and there's no doubt about that. But they also have a ministry for uh, rural development that uh, supports the, the small farms. And they did a survey showing that still most of the food that we're learning to eat come from uh, the small farms. So I think that's another part of the culture. Uh, I'm not, not a big fan of uh, food culture. Um, the culture has, cultures of food have changed throughout time. And I think it's critical that we change the food culture around the world now. Um, so we resort to food culture because people are comfortable with it. And, and in an uncomfortable world, food is comfort. We all have our comfort foods, I accept that. Many years ago, there was a U.S. Senator who was very uh, focused on saving the family farm in America. And he had a conversation with a friend of mine, and he said, I want to save the family farm. And this friend of mine said, define family farm for me. He said, 20 cows. How much income does this family farm need, my friend asked. This was some years ago. 
my friend who was uh, very gifted, calculated in front of the senator that that would increase the price of milk in the location in question 50%. And the senator looked at him and said, you know, do it for 40 cows. He changed the definition of family farm to suit the economic output that was necessary to sustain the economic price of milk. This is a very fast moving world right now. Of the 2 billion additional people that are on their way before 2050, does anybody in the room know where they're going to live? What's your guess? Africa. The entire population growth of the world going forward, essentially, obviously, some give and take here. Africa. Now, everybody's talking about Africa being the next great thing with regard to agriculture. Who's going to be buying that food from Africa? Africans, in some respect. I was, uh, I was just at the Milken Institute speaking on Myanmar and ASEAN and philanthropy in Southeast Asia and food security. And in the food security conversation, no one, no one, raise perennial crops. And I said, why aren't you talking about perennial crops? And of course the answer to that is because seed companies want to sell seeds. There are lots of things we're going to need to do and lots of ways we're going to have to think about food that we've never thought about it before, including things like perennials, by the way, and eating different things and stressing certain things and creating the opportunity for farmers to grow something other than what they've been growing so they generate some revenue so they can get out of the places that you may all think they want to live in the family farm, but which is not a place where their children can secure the future, where they can't compose a life of consequence and beauty. And if we fail to do that, we don't always, we don't only fail them, we fail ourselves and we fail the future. Thank you. Because of um, what was raised by uh, the other panelists before me, uh, it came the Indian thing, uh, reminding me of something, which is simple taste and preferences. So food preferences are also important and they come into the picture. Because in a traditional landscape, what we see in multi-use landscape, is that diversity is not only at the level of what you plant, and where, but it's also in the food that you cook at home and that you serve. And uh, clearly, because of different forces, because of tea, because of advertisement, because of uh, uh, the economy as it works, um, people have been uh, growing more and more uh, ashamed of their own food and their own uh, food preferences. And this is very true for many rural parts of, uh, of, uh, of Indonesia and other countries. And so now there are government efforts, which I think are very good, to try to uh, move away from a strictly rice diet, because rice was not necessarily the most culturally appropriate food for all of Indonesia. So uh, there is a lot of that that can be done, can be restored, can be revived, and can be moved. It's quite staggering the amount of, uh, and there have been interesting studies conducted on the diversity of uh, food, uh, um, of cultural, traditional menus in, uh, in, in Borneo and other places, uh, using products from the forest, from the rice fields, from the fields, from, from the edges of the rivers, from, uh, from a multitude of uh, places. And, Thing. And that is important to, uh, to maintain because it comes down to why is it that people, farmers, plant more than one variety of rice, which is, might be enough. You have a higher yield, you have enough to feed, you, to feed yourself. Is it because, yes, because they like certain varieties, so they want to maintain them and they keep planting. But it's also because why do they plant two different varieties in the same area. Why? Because they taste good in the pot when you cook them and they like to, to enjoy that meal on, the, on their table that way. So it's as simple as this. Thank you. Thank you. If we can, then I'd like to move on to the audience um, for questions. Yes. 
Are there microphones that are being passed around? And we're not going to run back and forth, but I think there are. Actually, if you can, um, so a microphone's coming to you now. If you have questions, if you don't mind raising your hand, yeah, please. Um, pass it first to the gentleman. I saw his hand first. And then to the woman to his right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, Leslie, you are naming Indo Indovia. I think it should be should be naming one one uh, product only. This is just this you. Uh, actually, we in the city we eat also more McDonald's and Kentucky. <laughs> so so that is the reality. Uh, we are now basically being influenced by the global food market. That is the first. But that is my comment on the uh, addressing to you, uh, Leslie. But actually, uh, to Ambassador, Sir, I translate the film of uh, The Greatest Good. The one that you mentioned is actually now on film. It's The Greatest Good. The story of 100 years of conversion of forests in the US. And after 100 years, they back, the forest is back even more than before, that is in the U.S. In the case of Indonesia, in the U.S. you need 100 years, but here we need only 20 years, believe it or not, because we use tractors. In the greatest good movie, you use the X and so, right? The speed of the forest destruction is much, much higher. So I'm really sure, I'm, I'm really, Convinced that improved productivity is important. Thankfully, I'm now working for April, the plantation forest, where for half a million hectares we can produce about 9 million cubic meters. But for the 24 million hectares of our natural forest, we only produce now less than 5 million cubic meters. So big difference, isn't it? So actually, if we use the land properly, we can have up to 10 million of plantation forests. We can have 30 million of, uh, what you call it, national parks. Sir, do you have a question? For yes. The okay, yeah. I think you to okay. okay, thank you. So, in my, my uh, intervention here is actually, we have forgotten only looking at the deforestation but we are forgotten for degradation. The degradation of forest in Indonesia is alarmingly, alarmingly very much. The question is actually, why there is still big problem or big uh, issue related to plantation in Indonesia? If it is improving the, the productivity, we should support improving the productivity. So I, Thank you. this is addressed to all of you. Thank you. Let me just simply say that the science on palm oil plantations providing the same kind of benefits from a climate standpoint as, as forests is not as complete as we would want, but there is no support for the equivalency of palm oil plantations and, and, and for, for natural forests. No support. The fact is that the rainforest is, uh, provides much more than, in terms of climate change, than palm oil. The, the sinks that palm oil provides in terms of CO2 isn't even close. So I don't know if your question was, gee, why aren't we in the same place if we just plant a lot of trees, and isn't that the same thing as America? Because we, first off, we have a northern deciduous forest, which is not, is not as much of a sink. Half the year, the U.S. forests don't have leaves. And that's a problem in terms of oxygen or, or CO2 sequestration. That's why the rainforests in the tropics are so incredibly important with regard to, to climate change. So I'm not sure I understood your premise, but if your premise was that they're the same thing, they're not. We're going to move on. Next question, please. Please pass the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Linda Howard, and I am the director of the World Food Program here in Indonesia. The World Food Program is a UN organization that works on food security together with FAO and IFAD. What I found very interesting was the correlation that you were mentioning between nutrition and uh, forest cover. And uh, indeed, uh, it is a fact 
that you find much less malnutrition in amongst forest populations uh, because they have access to a wealth of food commodities that we hardly know. So uh, there is a challenge really about more knowledge about the nutritional contribution that forests bring to people. If you make a parallel between this situation and then the obesity that you see in urban areas, uh, you can see that there is something which is called distance and uh, for the World Food Programme, which is mainly a logistics organization also, it's called the supply chain. Uh, with growing urbanization, there is a need to reduce the cost of food and reducing the cost of food means also reducing the cost of transport. And it means standardizing a lot. Uh, do you see the possibility of developing more local markets, developing more local knowledge about what forests can contribute so that you can address food security and availability of good quality food and good nutrition in a decentralized way rather than according to the current very heavily urbanized model? Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to take that question. Yes. Um, I like your question, but I'm not sure I can give you an answer or anything. But what I, I, I could only join into your question by saying that I would like to see a lot more accurate mapping of the issue of food security in its complexity. Because I don't think, when we look at the maps and they exist uh, from the statistic office, they basically lump together big areas that are highly forested areas and say high risk of food security. Why? Because of the lack of infrastructure, because of the lack of uh, the distance from the market and all of that. Which is true. This is why also earlier I said we need to reverse this trend. At the same time, these are areas where we know nothing because there is no very little research done, uh, not enough, about what is being used as food, what uh, the various sources of food, the landscape, the multiplicity of the <coughs> landscape that can provide food, for which there is hardly ever any food security per se issue. So I think that uh, a good mapping of this would would bring in staggering questions, uh, answers to this. Thank you. Thank you. In the interest of timing, I think we're just going to um, have a few questions asked at once and then open it up to the panel to ask a few. So I see one, two, three hands over here, and I'm afraid if you can save your questions for after the session or beyond that. Thank you. So if you could just ask your question, please, no comments. Uh, my question is, uh, you brought up the word indigenous. And I'm curious, I don't think that giving farmers cows or intensifying crops is a necessarily the solution. Um, but I'm curious if, if, if uh, scientists are trying to incorporate indigenous knowledge into um, sustainable landscapes to integrate forests with agroforestry so we can maintain the ecosystem services of the forests and at the same time provide the nutritious food that uh, traditionally supported uh, uh, indigenous cultures. Thank you. One question in the front. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm trying to be very short. Uh, from the messages from all the panelists, and especially the moderator, it appears that there is something called knowledge which has a solution to the problems we have identified, uh, but it may not be so. and. Uh, uh, it, uh, there are many facts which, uh, on which we are closing our eyes. Uh, for example, the UNFCC decision uh, to promote GM trees as legal uh, in a resolution approved by the COP. Uh, there are many other such things. Uh, your question, we, are, we are changing yeah. definitions of uh, forest. There are new terminologies coming up like mosaic forest. Don't you think we are retreating and closing our eyes? Uh, I saw on many facts. Thank you. And the last question was right here. Perfect. Just bear with me, okay, for one second, because this 
I'd love to get a response from David Garber about this, and this relates to the future of our planet. This is really important. I work for WWF in Singapore. I'm a vegan ultra endurance athlete, and I know about the importance of nutrition. And I think one of the most pertinent things that's been said at this summit over two days, perhaps the most pertinent, is what you said about understanding what's important for the planet, and then we'll understand what's important for ourselves. But we also don't, don't understand what's important for ourselves in terms of nutrition. What are we going to do to educate not just the countries we're, we're in right now here in ASEAN, but the whole world about the importance of nutrition? Because right now we're totally misguided. We're consuming palm oil at crazy amounts. Deforestation is occurring uh, at levels that it's just completely unsustainable. And by 2050, we're looking at 60% increase in food production. How are we going to teach people the importance of nutrition? Because I believe the importance of nutrition is where is the crux of everything we're addressing here. Yeah, thank you. Great. If we can open it back up to the panel, we have 10 minutes before we're closing. I'm sorry, we can reserve it for after the, the discussion now. We just have a few minutes left to talk to people. So if you can fold your concluding comments into the questions that were asked, you have two minutes each. Thank you. Well, given that direct appeal, I guess I ought to start. I think that one of the things that I've learned over the course of the last three years is what I said in my opening remarks, it's, it's very difficult to convince anyone of anything. I can sit with my best friends and we can agree on the conclusion and have no agreement after a day about how to get there. One of the challenges that we have is that people select the facts that suit their worldview. They select the things that support what it is they already believe. And what your question raises one of these very important concerns. We have seen over the course of the last 20 years, when we began to look more about nutrition, are fats good for you? It turns out now maybe they're not so bad, right? Uh, are eggs good for you? Uh, how much protein do you need? And on and on and on. And the answers flip back and forth. And so people check, pick the answer they like, right? I don't eat red meat. But somebody else says, there's no evidence. And look at the last study. Right? I can only offer this in two minutes. Stanford has just opened up a center which is going to look at research and how inaccurate it is. The, the law of small numbers. And you might want to pay attention to what's happening there. Um, it's opening up soon. And what they're going to do is look at studies, particularly medical studies, and essentially prove why they really are invalid. And the statistics as to the invalidity of these studies is stunning. Like 85% are really just not on point. We've got to get better data. We've got to be better at what the research really shows us. And there are some things happening, I think, good things happening with regard to that. So, yeah, we need to look at the evidence. There is, does tend to be quite often um, policy-based evidence and making the other way around. Um, but we also have to be careful about the way we're asking these questions and what sort of uh, research and evidence we're looking for. So, yeah, I think in nutrition we, there is a sort of history of um, asking simple questions, a reductionist approach, and getting, and getting simple answers. Um, and we, I think we do have to still look back at, yes, food cultures, um, indigenous knowledge, or more broadly traditional knowledge, um, you know, if cultures and practices that have, have taken the test of time. That's not to say we should close our eyes to the latest scientific information, but we, I think a little bit of um, humility in how we address um, those issues is, is, uh, is important. We're, we're learning now that, you know, it's not a, just a, a matter of the nutrients, so it's not just calories, it's now not just nutrients, it's also the interaction of those nutrients with the biodiversity we have inside us, right? Our microbiome inside us. And that is, there's more and more evidence that's related uh, not only to things like nutrition directly, but to allergies and all sorts of non-communicable diseases. And in turn, we're just beginning to understand the links between that biodiversity and the biodiversity in the environment. 
So be careful about simple uh, solutions. Um, and I think this being careful about simple solutions is the same when we can, we're looking at, at, at <coughs> land management, where we're looking at industrialization, uh, whether the land sharing versus land sparing debate is another misguided dichotomy, I think. We need to, we, there will be different situations in different places, they have to come from the bottom up and they have to involve everybody's type of knowledge. I'm uh, also a little bit uh, pessimistic, uh, educating people and when we see uh, the history of agricultural extension services, uh, we wanted to educate the farmers in this and that direction every five years different and they were very reluctant and the ones who kept to their own um, often uh, came better out. So um, I would say we can reduce the influence of the, um, of the lifestyle messages from the television that this is the one uh, urban high consumption, uh, high protein uh, or high um, fat, uh, diet lifestyle and people respect for their own uh, diets and their own um, and, uh, the we can take instead of sending this one message, which might be then to uh, to shorten or to uh, reductions. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to say that there are there are certain foods which people seem to feel you know th these are the sorts of things that you must food which you should eat in order to adopt the sort of modern um, middle class, if you like upper class if you want lifestyle. I mean you should maybe, you know, change your food from a rice based food to based on potato chips, um, these sorts of things. But you know there is if you talk just about Indonesia to start with, there is a tremendous amount of nutritional knowledge among indigenous people, among other people, about good foods, about foods which are produced locally, which can easily be produced locally. If you look at Brazil, and you mentioned Brazil, there, there they eat a lot of foods which come from the forest, which have been made very popular. Um, if you think of one in particular called acai, which is a fruit which grows in a forest, and the fact that that has now become extremely popular in Brazil because it is a very good source of vitamin C, it's become popular in America and other places, um, you know, important people on television have picked it up. But because that's been picked up, the forest which produces that crop has come back, has expanded, and there is now much more production of that particular crop, which is a forest crop which is simply gathered, been gathered from the forest. So those sorts of things can work in together. That you can have a forest which people will replant, will use important uh, nutritional substances, can come from those forests. In Brazil they do it. They take the local traditional foods, they make them popular, people want to eat them, and then they can expand to even people like Oprah Winfrey. And so, you know, they can become popular, suddenly these things become popular, but they are very good nutritional foods. And I think it's time that perhaps people in Indonesia and other parts of Southeast Asia looked at what their forest can produce, what the indigenous foods are, and the value of them, because they have immense value for ordinary people to produce a good, uh, nutritious uh, diet and a good lifestyle. And that's been adopted by people at all sorts of levels. Okay. Thank you. I think there is a slight hint of being very quick. In my case, finally. <laughs> no, I, I will be quick because I think there are two, um, two words. Um, Complexity, again, and connectivity. And I think these are two key concepts for sustainable landscapes. They're also key concepts for us to find, all of us, to find sustainable <coughs> solutions for the future. Thank you. My thanks to the panel, to all of you. I have two quick announcements. Thank you. I want